Throughout the reign of King Henry VIII, 70,000 people were executed across England and his kingdom. There were scores of people who were not famous, who could not accept the king's changes to the country, and because of this they incurred the wrath in some of the most brutal ways possible. Men were hanged, drawn and quartered for suspected involvement in treason. Women were taken to the gallows, accused of many crimes, and some of the most high-profile people across the nation lost their heads at scaffolds such as Tower Hill. It was a brutal period of time, however Henry VIII did have a number of forgotten executions of people who were not the most well known, and these are his forgotten victims, who were at times overshadowed by those such as his wives. This is the forgotten executions of Henry VIII's reign, and as always to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. On the 17th of August 1510, two high-profile men, who were considered hated within England, left the Tower of London through the gates and made the short walk north to Tower Hill. This was a site where public beheadings took place inside of the capital, and Sir Edmund Dudley and Sir Richard Empson walked past the people of London before they arrived and were handed over to the axemen, who would take off their heads. Sir Edmund Dudley was the father of John Dudley, who later became the Duke of Northumberland, and his grandson was Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, who was regarded as a favourite of Queen Elizabeth I. He had served Henry VII as a close advisor and privy councillor, and also as the Speaker of the House of Commons, and the President of the King's Council. Sir Richard Empson had also served Henry VII as the Speaker of the House, but also as a Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. Both these two had been prominent members of the King's Council, and were linked to the finances of the country. Both of the men were regarded as unpopular people within England, as they became the King's most trusted ministers, and they were the chief orchestrators of the King's financial policies. It was said that they were seen to have been almost universally hated throughout England. They were accused of acting illegally when they extorted large sums of money from wealthy landowners, and of not only obtaining this money for the King, but of enriching themselves in the process. This meant that both of them were involved in increasing the revenue of the King, which was needed at the time, but they did it by imposing harsh and unfair taxes onto the country. This caused for people to suffer, and the pair were also accused of pocketing money for themselves from the good people of England. These two people were so unpopular that for Henry VIII to target them shortly after he came into power was a smart thing. Henry VII died on the 21st of April 1509, and Empson and Dudley were arrested three days after. This shows how reviled they were across England, and they were imprisoned within the Tower of London. They were both accused of plotting to hold, guide and govern the king and his council, but assembling men to undertake a coup d'etat. It's likely that this was untrue, and that the men were in fact scapegoats for the unpopular financial measures imposed by Henry VII. Whilst at the Tower plans were drawn up to help the pair escape, but Dudley in particular then abandoned his plan to escape. Parliament were hesitant initially to confirm the act of attainder, legislation passed that would allow the pair to be executed without any trial. Whilst inside the tower it's considered, their imprisonment was rather comfortable, but Dudley wrote the Tree of Commonwealth, a treaty of government and society, and he hoped this would gain favour with him and the new king, Henry VIII. He stated in this that the roots of government and policy are in peace, justice and godliness. But Henry VIII showed no mercy to the pair. On the 17th of August 1510, the pair made their way to Tower Hill. By Henry VIII's standards, their execution was a win for him. By ordering the executions of these two, he was in a sense gaining a huge amount of favour with the people, as they were so despised. Both of them were taken up to Tower Hill, where the public beheading spot had been prepared, and walking through the short walk, they were flanked by guards. As soon as they arrived at the scaffold, their execution was prepared. They were asked to say their final words, and then were beheaded in swift fashion, by the axe. With the swing of the axe, people cheered as the hated figures were no more, and Henry VIII instantly won favour and support. The executions of Empson and Dudley were the first high-profile ones of Henry VIII's reign, in which he would execute two of his queens and some of his closest friends and advisers. The pair were hated across the nation, and with the swing of the executioner's axe, the old regime of Henry VII was no more. However, the people on Tower Hill that day would never have expected to see what would happen over the course of the next four decades, as Henry VIII reigned 
and became the most famous and brutal king that England has ever had. John Fisher was born in 1469 in Yorkshire and he was the eldest son of a wealthy merchant. But his father died when he was eight and his mother remarried and had a number of other children. Fisher went on to study at Cambridge University before he was ordained as a priest in 1491 and he had a number of royal supporters. He was backed by Lady Margaret Beaufort, the mother of King Henry VII and he became her confessor in 1497 and he convinced her to found Christ College and St John's College at Cambridge University. Fisher was close with Margaret and after her death he became the Chancellor of Cambridge and also the Bishop of Rochester. He was seen as a perfect and model bishop at the time and he was very busy with his own diocese. He went to different churches and also visited and cared for people inside of his land of responsibility. He was an active preacher, he was very enthusiastic and he was clearly talented. He was even appointed to preach the funeral oration for King Henry VII and Lady Margaret, but despite Fisher's status within the church, he did come into conflict with one of his former pupils, the new King Henry VIII. Problems arose with regards to the money left by Margaret Beaufort for colleges at Cambridge, and the king was jealous of this, believing he was entitled to this money. Fisher was a brilliant scholar, and he alluded to being the author of the Royal Treaty Against Martin Luther, and the criticisms of the church he published in 1521. Henry VIII following this work was then given the title the defender of the faith by the Catholic Church and Fisher preached sermons in cathedrals across the land against Martin Luther and the Reformation. He was staunchly anti-Protestant and ordered the arrests of reformative priests and preachers. Fisher was prospering greatly in Tudor England and he was in the king's good books but following Henry VIII's wish to divorce his first wife Catherine of Aragon things changed massively for him. Fisher was involved in the theological proceedings against Catherine of Aragon and the king was desperate to have the support of leading writers and also Fisher. Fisher to begin with backed the king but he came to the conclusion that the king would divorce Catherine of Aragon in order to marry Anne Boleyn and therefore he would split from Rome. Being a man of his conscience Fisher went against the king and Henry became a target of Fisher's preaching. He was an outspoken critic and Fisher was a strong supporter of Catherine in the proceedings and wrote letters to support the Queen and also published propaganda in support of her. This was incredibly brave and he believed deeply that the Pope ruled supreme over the Church and that to reform the Church should be done only by the Pope and not the monarchy of a country. In 1531 he refused to accept Henry VIII's title as the supreme head of the Church of England and refused to acknowledge the act of supremacy later on. He also refused to acknowledge Anne Boleyn as the rightful Queen of England, and he later refused to acknowledge the heirs of Anne and Henry as the rightful ones to the throne, but because of this, he was imprisoned inside the Tower of London. He was held and imprisoned on the 26th of April 1534, and at this time he was an elderly man in his mid-sixties, and he was rather ill. There were attempts to get him to submit and take an oath, but these did not work. Fisher was accused of treason and things got tougher for him inside the tower as he was held inside the cold and dark cells within the tower and he was underfed to get him to give in. He was held inside the Tower of London for over a year and he was allowed food and drink sent in from friends and was even allowed a servant but he was not allowed a personal priest. Fisher was in correspondence with Cromwell about his imprisonment and how harsh things were but he was caught like a rabbit in the headlights. Richard Rich, a member of court, tried to catch Fisher out and he asked Fisher for his real opinion and Fisher admitted that the king was not the supreme head of the Church of England. The Pope was in the process at the time of trying to make Fisher a cardinal as he believed it would save his life and Henry was outraged at this. He said that if the cardinal's hat arrived he would make sure that John Fisher had no head left to wear it. On the 17th of June 1535, Bishop John Fisher was tried in front of a jury made up of Thomas Cromwell, Thomas Boleyn and ten others. Richard Rich testified and this was deemed enough to sentence Fisher to death for treason and he was sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered. But the king then commuted this sentence to beheading in a small act of mercy. Following his condemnation he said, I think indeed and have always thought that 
and do now lastly affirm that his grace cannot justly claim any such supremacy over the church of God. I pray God his grace may remember himself in good time and hearken to good counsel for the preservation of himself and his realm. Fisher was then transported back to the Tower of London to await his death sentence. But inside of London there was a great outcry of support for John Fisher. People began to draw comparisons between him and John the Baptist. John the Baptist was executed by King Herod for challenging the validity of Herod's marriage. Henry VIII even considered that this could have been a real thing, and he commuted Fisher's beheading to be done before the 23rd of June, which was John the Baptist's feast day. He feared a riot inside the capital on the day of Fisher's execution. On the 22nd of June 1535, Fisher was led from the Tower of London to Tower Hill, which was a short walk away. This was a site where many people were beheaded during the reign of King Henry VIII, and on the short journey and short walk, he prayed the entire time, and when he came to the stairs of the scaffold, he was offered a hand up, but he refused. Fisher then went up the stairs, but as he climbed, the sun shone in his face. It was roughly ten o'clock, and the executioner was ready to perform his bloody job. It was said of that day, the executioner kneeled down to him, as the fashion was, and asked him forgiveness. I forgive thee, said he, with all my heart, and I trust thou shalt see me overcome this storm lustily. Then his gown and tippet were taken from him, and he stood in his doublé and hose in front of the people. Whereof here was no such number assembled to see the execution. Fisher was then stripped for his execution, and was incredibly emaciated, which shocked the crowd, and it showed how horrible conditions were that he was kept inside of the tower. He stood on the scaffold and said to the crowd, Christian people, I am come hither to die, for the faith of Christ's holy Catholic Church, and I thank God, hitherto my stomach hath served me well. I beseech Almighty God, of his infinite goodness, to save the King in this realm, and that it may please him to hold his holy hand over it, and send the King a good counsel. It was noted that he seemed positive and spoke with courage, and he was relieved that his imprisonment would not continue. Following this, he fell to his knees and prayed once more, and then the executioner came to Fisher and placed a handkerchief around his eyes. Fisher then lifted his hands and heart to heaven and said some more prayers, and then he laid his head on the little block. The executioner stood there with his sharp and heavy axe. In one swift blow, he cut the head of Bishop John Fisher off, and it was said his neck bled greatly, and there was a huge amount of blood which shocked the crowd. But following his death... Henry VIII treated his remains awfully. His body was stripped and left on the scaffold for hours, until the evening. It was then taken on pikes and thrown naked into a rough grave in a nearby churchyard. Fisher's head was then placed on London Bridge, and it was said it looked lifelike weeks after. But then it was thrown into the River Thames two weeks later, to make way for that of Thomas More's decapitated head. His body was then placed inside the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula at the Tower of London later. Bishop John Fisher died a man of his conscience and a man of great faith. He believed that he was doing the right thing and he supported Catherine of Aragon, which grossly offended the king and his enemy in Henry VIII, who was one who would not hesitate to order his brutal execution. History's most famous and notorious king would order Fisher's brutal execution and because of this, he sent a strong message to those of England. During his reign, 70,000 people would be executed in England, a huge number which equated to around 3% of the total population. Anyone who dared to cross Henry VIII usually ended up imprisoned, then executed in a number of different ways, accused of treason. The most influential of Henry VIII's wives who changed the face of English history forever, was Anne Boleyn, his second wife. Henry's need to annul his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon plunged England into great religious turmoil, and the scandal caused by the king and Anne's relationship caused chaos across the country. But Anne herself met a very bloody downfall, and was wrapped in a web of treason, deceit and adultery, accused of sleeping with a number of other men, including her own brother. The story of Anne's execution is well told, but what about those men who were executed for their involvement with Henry VIII's Queen? Join us today as we look at the Boleyn Scandal Executions, and remember to support our channel 
please make sure to subscribe. Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn were married in very controversial fashion. The Pope would not grant the King the divorce from Catherine of Aragon that Henry greatly wished for, and Anne would refuse to take the King's bed before the King's great matter was resolved. Henry consulted with scholars, and he took their advice, which was that no one was above the King, with regards to matters involving his own country. With this, Henry disregarded the Pope, and decided that he would split from Rome, and declare himself the supreme head of the Church of England, and then he issued legislation around this. This caused chaos with Europe, and Henry feared a great Catholic invasion of his country from Spain and the Holy Roman Empire. But Henry's quest for a second wife was wrapped in the belief that he thought that Anne Boleyn could provide him with a male heir, and she captivated him with seduction and her personality. Anne was made queen, and then she gave birth to a daughter Elizabeth, but Anne's downfall was caused by the fact she could not provide the male heir that Henry greatly wanted. Anne continued to miscarry and frustrate the king, and she knew by 1535 that she was in great danger if she could not provide Henry with the son he wished for. Anne Boleyn in her final pregnancy was greatly stressed, as Henry VIII had a terrible accident on the tilt yard, following a joust that led to him being knocked out for hours. Some believe this incident changed the king's life forever, and he even could have had a severe brain injury because of this. Anne's final pregnancy ended in tragedy, as she miscarried a child that many believed was a son. Henry's attention and desires shifted to Jane Seymour, who would go on to give birth to Henry's successor, Edward VI. It was Thomas Cromwell who became the man tasked with finding the king a way out of his marriage with Anne Boleyn, and Cromwell engineered a web of lies against her that resulted in Anne being accused of adultery, incest and treason. These were all false charges, and the evidence for these was manufactured by Cromwell, and Anne Boleyn was arrested. She was imprisoned at the Tower of London, and then placed on trial, but there were five men who were accused of having intimate relations with Henry VIII's Queen. One of the most shocking allegations made against Anne Boleyn was incest, and one of the five men accused of sleeping with her was George Boleyn, her brother. George himself was a courtier, and played a prominent role in Tudor politics in the early 1530s. He was introduced to Henry VIII's court at the age of 10, and he impressed the king and became a pageboy to him. As he grew older, he became Henry VIII's esquire to the body, which meant George Boleyn was responsible for dressing the king, and he then became the master of the hounds in 1528, and planned the royal hunting parties. He was friends with a number of other prominent courtiers, and was well linked at court. But George, as he was close with his sister, and as they had a close relationship, was framed for allegedly sleeping with her, a scandalous accusation that would ruin the Boleyn family. George was charged with adultery with his sister, and also treason against the king, being charged with plotting to kill Henry VIII, and he was arrested on the 2nd of May 1536. George stood trial a few hours after his sister Anne on the 15th of May, and the pair were tried away from the other men accused. Anne was found guilty, and because of this, George's sentence was also obviously going to be guilty. The charge against him did not fail, and despite there being no evidence of a relationship between he and his sister, the Queen, the judges at his trial believed this to have occurred, and George was sentenced to death. At court, most people believed George's innocence, but he was found guilty and was killed. It was initially said that he would be hanged, drawn and quartered, but because of his service to the King, this was changed to a more straightforward beheading. He went to the executioner's block on Tower Hill on the 17th of May 1536, along with four other men, who themselves were sentenced to death for their involvement with the Queen. On the scaffold, George made a long speech, showing his skills as a public speaker, and the crowd silently listened to his every word, where he talked about religion and a need for change. He did not admit any guilt, but asked God for forgiveness, before he gave his neck over to the executioner. George was executed two days before Anne was. Henry Norris was another of those men who stood opposite George Boleyn on Tower Hill. He was the groom of the stool in Henry VIII's privy chamber, a close servant of the king, and one who had been in charge of tending to the king's bowel movements. He was a very good friend of Henry VIII, and was given a number of different jobs. Norris was one of Henry's closest friends, and was given a number of castles for his loyalty, but he was also close with Anne Boleyn, and because of this he was targeted by Cromwell, with the downfall of Anne. He was found guilty of treason and adultery, and was sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered, but like George's sentence, 
This was later commuted to beheading. Norris refused to talk about any guilt on the scaffold, as he did not want to risk further punishment for himself or his family, and he was very quiet when he faced the executioner's axe. Later, Queen Elizabeth I would talk of Norris's loyalty, and said that he died protecting her mother's innocence in the scandal. Mark Smeaton inside of Henry VIII's court was a budding musician, and he was just a young man of around 23 when he was executed. He was a skilled musician and singer, and was known to have been very dashing and handsome at court. He played the lute, viola and other instruments, and was also a talented dancer, who would dance with women at court. He was of lowly birth, and was never in the close circles of the Berlins, but was told off once by Anne for the way he spoke to her. Whilst in her chamber, Mark Smeaton played music for Anne, and she talked to him about her sadness, and with this small and seemingly insignificant conversation, it was used as ammunition by Cromwell to accuse Anne. Smeaton was accused like the others of adultery and was tortured, with a knotted cord being pulled around his eyes. He was then sent to the Tower of London, and the fact he spent large amounts of money before his arrest attracted further suspicion. This was used by Cromwell as Anne Boleyn rewarding him for his services, and he claimed that this was paid for sexual favours. Smeaton, whilst held inside of the tower, was tortured using the rack, and he then confessed to being the Queen's lover. The evidence behind this was false, and Smeaton gave his guards the names of the four men, who also slept with the Queen, and these were the other four men executed. He was led to his execution with great controversy, as a crowd were disgusted that the Queen could have slept with a man of such low status. He said on the scaffold, Masters, I pray you will pray for me, for I have deserved the death. He was beheaded and was not drawn or quartered, the sentence of treason for a commoner. Interestingly, Bloody Mary I, the eldest child of Henry VIII, believed Elizabeth I, her half-sister, was a daughter of Mark Smeaton, and she helped to perpetuate rumours further about this. William Brereton was another groom of the Privy Chamber, and he was also married to the daughter of the first Earl of Worcester. The king liked him, and he was given royal land in Cheshire in the Welsh marches, which brought him a large income each year, making him very wealthy. In May 1536, Brereton was accused of sleeping with Anne Boleyn, and Anne allegedly solicited him on the 16th of November 1533, and it was said 11 days later further relationships occurred. It was considered that Brereton's work in the Welsh marches saw him linked to the conspiracy to eliminate his power, and he was found guilty and was beheaded. Before his execution he said, The cause whereof I die, judge not, but if you judge, judge best, stating that he was truly innocent. The final man sentenced to death for the Berlin scandal was Sir Francis Weston. He too was executed for adultery and high treason, and was a gentleman of the Privy Chamber. He was a rather sporty man and even beat Henry VIII at tennis and bowls, and he was good friends with Henry. Thomas Cromwell investigated Anne Boleyn's ladies-in-waiting to find out dirt about her, and Anne had told off Francis Weston for flirting with Mad Shelton, who was betrothed to another man at court, Henry Norris, who he himself was also executed. Francis was tied to the plot, and despite being just 25, he was sentenced to death for adultery behind the king's back. His father tried all he could to get his son spared, even offering the whole finances of the family to gain a royal pardon, but Henry VIII refused to do this. He was beheaded along with the other men on Tower Hill on the 17th of May 1536. All of the men who died along with Anne Boleyn for the charges that the Queen faced were murdered practically. It's considered that there was no valid evidence for their execution and that Cromwell invented much of the claims to gain favour with Henry VIII. Cromwell was the architect of Anne Boleyn's downfall, and with this came the execution of five innocent members of the King's court, some of whom were very close to Henry VIII. All of the charges were false, and the men paid the ultimate price being murdered by an axeman who would perform the wishes of Cromwell. Anne too was beheaded, but she was given the decency of a private execution within the walls of the Tower of London on Tower Green, where Cromwell himself would witness her beheading. In one swift blow, a French swordsman struck off her head, but there was not just one victim of Anne's execution. There were many, including the men sentenced to death with her, and also her daughter was a victim, the woman who later became the greatest Tudor monarch of them all, Elizabeth I. Thomas Cromwell is remembered for being the chief minister to Henry VIII, 
and he led the dissolutions of the monasteries, a brutal policy which resulted in executions, theft of wealth and huge-scale evictions of monks and priests. The dissolution made Henry VIII and Cromwell very rich, and Cromwell became Henry VIII's number one minister. But Cromwell is also remembered for the fact he was the architect of the downfall of Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's second wife. Anne eventually went to her execution on Tower Green, but it wasn't long before Cromwell made a short journey from the Tower of London to his own site of execution, following his fall from grace. But there was a man who was executed alongside Cromwell, as he wasn't the only man beheaded on the 28th of July, 1540, on Tower Hill, and both of their heads were then placed on pikes above London Bridge. But who was this? Join us today as we look at the mysterious man executed with Thomas Cromwell. And remember to support our channel. Please make sure to subscribe. Walter Hungerford was born in 1503 and was the only child of Sir Edward Hungerford, a man who was in the court of Henry VIII and even attended the Field of the Cloth of Gold. But two years following this, Walter's father had died. But then shortly after, Walter himself was present at Henry VIII's court and he became a squire to the body of the king, a job which granted him exclusive access to Henry VIII. This job was fairly high at court, and he would have been a personal attendant to the king, inside of the household, and would also have been involved in dressing Henry VIII in his finest clothes. Many at court would have been jealous of Walter's job. Because of his closeness with the king, he was granted a number of allowances and land. Hungerford was well valued, and was married three times. In particular, his third wife, Elizabeth Hussey, the daughter of the first Baron Hussey of Sleaford, spoke to her father, saying that he wished to be introduced to Thomas Cromwell. Hungerford wished to become the Sheriff of Wiltshire, and this was later given to him, but Walter Hungerford became a close ally of Thomas Cromwell. Cromwell recommended to the King that Walter should be rewarded for his support and helpfulness in Wiltshire. He then was summoned to Parliament, and was named as Lord Hungerford of Hatesbury. It was clear that Walter Hungerford was a prominent and positive member of the King's court, and he built up strong alliances with other key members, such as Cromwell. It was almost as if nothing could go wrong for him, but in 1540 things drastically changed. His association and link with Cromwell would lead to his downfall and execution. Cromwell had been letting the King down for a number of months, and in particular it was he who proposed a marriage match between Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves. This resulted in the king forcibly having to marry Anne against his wishes, even though he considered her ugly. Their annulment settlement ended up costing Henry heavily, and Anne became very wealthy, and Cromwell's enemies dug their talons in to bring him down following this failure. Cromwell was arrested in June 1540 for plotting to kill the king and treason. But Walter Hungerford had been a nasty and cruel man for some time. He was abusive to his wife, and he locked her in a tower at Farley Hungerford, and he tried to starve her and poison her. Cromwell would receive a letter from Elizabeth saying how she had been continually locked in one of my lord's towers of his castle in Hungerford, as I have been these three or four years past without any comfort of any creature, and under the custody of my lord's chaplain, which has once or twice heretofore poisoned me. I have none of a meat nor drink, but such as cometh from the said priest. I have drank my own water, or else I should die for lack of sustenance. With this, Elizabeth was saying she even resorted to drinking her own urine. Elizabeth had asked Cromwell for divorce proceedings, as she said, I may sooner object such matters against him, with many other detestable and urgent causes, that he can against me, if I would express them, as he well knoweth. It was possible in these words that she alluded to her husband, having intimate relations with other men, but Cromwell ignored this and took no notice. But as Cromwell's fall from grace came, Walter Hungerford's would also. Rumours were circulating around the royal court about his treatment of his wife, and the Privy Council began to investigate. Along with the abuse, Hungerford was accused of three crimes. The first was that he employed a priest in his house, who classed Henry VIII as a heretic, and had preached defamatory sermons against the king. The second crime was that he employed another priest, who was referred to as a doctor or a witch, and that he predicted when the king would die, an offence which was linked to treason. The third offence he was accused of was committing unnatural acts, which had been outlawed by an act known as the Buggery Act. It was said he was accused of, replate, with innumerable detestable and abominable vices and wretchedness of living, and have accustomedly exercised, frequented, 
and used the abominable and detestable vice and sin of buggery with William Master, Thomas Smith and other of his servants. These offences were incredibly serious, and because of his link to Cromwell, he was also sentenced to death. Both Hungerford and Cromwell were imprisoned at the Tower of London, and were taken to Tower Hill on the 28th of July 1540. Cromwell and Hungerford were both beheaded by acts on the same day. It was said of Hungerford that on the scaffold, and before his execution, he seemed so unquiet that many judged him, rather in a frenzy than otherwise, alluding to the fact he went to his death with panic and great noise. Hungerford was beheaded after Cromwell was, but it's not known if it went well or was botched. But Walter Hungerford was the forgotten and mysterious man who was executed alongside Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's key advisor. It's clear that he was linked to the royal court, but he was a terrible man who was awful to his wife. He went to his death alongside a man who he greatly respected and wished to be close with, but when Cromwell fell from grace, Walter Hungerford would also. He was accused of a number of crimes, all of which carried the death penalty, and he was one of many who were executed throughout the Tudor period on Tower Hill. Margaret Pole was the daughter of George Plantagenet, the Duke of Clarence, who was a bit of a traitor during the Wars of the Roses. He crossed his own brother, Edward IV, a number of times, and he was also the brother of Richard III. Margaret's mother was a daughter of Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick, also known as Warwick Kingmaker. She did have royal blood, and because of this she was seen as dangerous by the Tudors, who could be the enemies of her family during the Wars of the Roses. Her childhood was dominated by the civil wars, and her uncle even ordered the execution of her father, and her father would lose his life inside the Tower of London, being drowned in a barrel of Malmsey wine. However, when Henry VII came onto the throne, and the Tudor dynasty began, he married Margaret's cousin Elizabeth of York, and Margaret was looked after by the new king and queen. In winter 1487, she was married to Henry VII's cousin, Sir Richard Pole, and she became close with Catherine of Aragon, who had come over to England to marry Henry VII's eldest son, Arthur. Margaret was left a widow in 1505 with five children, and she was forced to live inside of Sion Abbey and rely on the help of the nuns there. However, when Henry VIII came onto the throne, she came back to court. Henry VIII married Catherine of Aragon himself, the wife of his deceased brother, Arthur, and Margaret was a lady-in-waiting to Catherine, and Parliament also awarded her a significant amount of her brother's lands, and she became known as the Countess of Salisbury. Margaret was a strong woman who managed her lands well, and her sons also did very well, and they became significant members of the court and the royal household. But Margaret did lock horns with the king over her land, and how best to manage it, but she was close to the monarchy, and she was even the governess of Henry VIII's oldest daughter Mary, who would later be known as Bloody Mary I when she came onto the throne. She stayed loyal to Mary and Catherine, when the king tried to get rid of them in favour of Anne Boleyn, but Margaret's son was a real powerhouse against Henry VIII, who would dissent against the English king a lot. Reginald Pole was considered for being a cardinal, but he became a huge enemy of the English king. He spoke with a number of possible enemies to try and invoke an invasion of England. However, Margaret Pole then began to attract suspicion in the royal circles, and Margaret also refused to give Princess Mary's jewels back when she had been declared illegitimate and her household had been broken up. All this added to further upset and anger, and the king then said if the cardinal's hat was ever sent to England for Margaret's son, then he would not have a head to place a hat on top of. But Reginald continued to speak out against the king, and Henry VIII was now focused on wreaking havoc with the Pole family, who let's remember had royal blood, and could be considered a threat to his throne. Reginald Pole was made a cardinal in 1537, and he took part in organising the Pilgrimage of Grace, a huge northern uprising against the king and his changes to the church. This was the most serious rebellion Henry VIII faced during his reign, and the pilgrimage focused on the anger about the dissolutions of the monasteries, which left many monks homeless and penniless. It was cruel to the pious men and the women of God, and a number of abbots and senior figures in monasteries and convents across England were even hanged, drawn and quartered, being suspended from their own abbeys. But Margaret Pole and Geoffrey Pole, another of Margaret's sons, were implicated in the organisation of the rebellion, and Geoffrey was arrested in 1538. But then at the age of 65, Margaret Pole herself was arrested and was sent to the Tower of London. <laughs> 
She was accused of the incredibly serious charge of treason, and she lost all of her titles and lands, and an investigation turned out false evidence against her. Cromwell claimed he found a tunic in her home, allegedly showing the five wounds of Christ, and Paul was linked to the underground Catholic worship, and was accused of being a Catholic rebel. This was found allegedly six months after her home had been thoroughly searched, and it's believed that this was nonsense. However, it was a way that Cromwell and Henry VIII could sentence Margaret Pole, who was by the standards of the day, a very elderly woman, to death. Margaret Pole was left inside of the Tower of London after being accused for two and a half years, and every day she would wake up and wonder if this day would be her last. She knew the brutality of her king, and she knew what would happen to her. Inside of the tower, she was allowed a number of servants and grants of clothing. However, from the prison cell she wrote, For traitors on the block should die. I am no traitor, no, not I. My faithfulness stands fast and so. Towards a block I shall not go, nor make one step, as you shall see. Christ in thy mercy, save thou me. She was a desperate woman, and she was suffering from her prolonged imprisonment inside of the dark and damp tower. On the morning of the 27th of May 1541, Margaret Pole was told that within the next hour she would be executed and she was informed that the executioner was readying himself to end her life. She claimed that she had not committed any crimes and therefore she was guilty of nothing, but the king had ordered her execution. It was a killing which was hastily arranged and there was no scaffold and limited preparation time for the execution. There was simply just a wooden block placed on the cobbled pavements of the Tower of London waiting for Margaret Pole, along with an executioner who was armed with his axe. As she was a woman of royal blood, she was given a private execution within the walls of the Tower of London, and was not given the public spectacle which would have occurred on Tower Hill. There are differing accounts of her execution. At the age of 67, she went to her death, not knowing what she was accused of, and guilty of. The main executioner of London was sent north to deal with the rebels, in the wake of the Pilgrimage of Grace, and because of this, the man brought in to perform Margaret Pole's execution was very inexperienced. A report states how a wretched and blundering youth literally hacked her head and shoulders to pieces in the most pitiful manner. This account also states how it took around ten brutal swings of the axe to perform her execution and take her head from her body. Another account states how after the first blow from the axe, Margaret jumped up and managed to escape from the block and she then began to attempt to flee the executioner, and was chased by him around the courtyard, where the execution then took place. This then says that eleven swings of the axe were needed to behead her. But the similarity in these accounts, is that Margaret Pole died an incredibly brutal death, and let's remember that she was an elderly woman when this happened. Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury, was one of the forgotten victims of the Tower of London, during the reign of King Henry VIII, and her execution was one which made the tower a formidable and incredibly feared place of suffering. She was imprisoned for a number of years, but her execution ordeal was horrific and shocking. The first blow of the axe that struck her shoulders would have been excruciating, but if Margaret Pole did spring herself from the block following this, it's crazy to believe that this could have happened. But today she is considered a saint. Over the course of five years between 1535 and 1540, 18 Carthusian monks from London were executed on the orders of Henry VIII. These men refused to support Henry VIII's role as the supreme head of the Church of England and preferred to support the Pope. Carthusian monks are a Catholic religious order made up of monks and nuns and in Britain there were around 10 monasteries with men and women who conformed to the order before the Reformation. King Henry II founded them in 1181, so they had a long history in England, and they were usually made up of a small community of hermits, who spent their lives in silence and religious contemplation. Each monk was given their own living space inside of a charter house or abbey, and they spent their lives studying and devoting their lives to God. Today Carthusians can still be found, but during the Reformation and the reign of Henry VIII, the Tudor king attacked the monastic ways of life of these strongly Catholic men and women. A document titled The Charterhouse Monks stated how 18 Carthusians of the Charterhouse of London were sentenced to death for defending the liberty and freedom of the church against the Tudor king. These men all died in different ways, some of them were hanged, drawn and quartered, but they all had one similar outlook, 
they could not accept Henry VIII as the supreme head of the Church of England. They believed that the Pope ultimately had supremacy over the Church, and they believed that the Pope was the overall authority on the Church. But these men were known for being very peaceful and for living a life of solitude devoted to worship where they never really offended anyone, and they were brought all to prisons and execution sites and killed in front of huge crowds. Their executions were a clear warning to other religious people across the country to fall into line with the King's changes. On the 4th of May 1535, John Hewton was the prior of the London Charter House, Augustine Webster the prior of the Axholm Charter House, and Robert Lawrence the prior of the Beauvale Charter House, were all brought to Tyburn to a place of execution. Alongside another monk named Richard Reynolds, the four were executed, and the community of Carthusians had been ordered to swear a new oath, accepting Henry VIII's supremacy. These members could not accept this, and they asked Cromwell to be exempt from the religious changes, and Cromwell responded by throwing them into prison, and he then put them on trial, where they were all found guilty of treason, and were sentenced to death. They were all killed, being hanged, drawn and quartered, the most brutal form of execution. The three priors were taken from their prison cells to Tyburn, to the Tyburn tree, where they were dragged behind horses on hurdles, in front of the large crowds, whilst they were still dressed in their monks' robes. Sir Thomas More saw them from his cell at the Tower of London, and was distressed by what he saw. When they got to Tyburn, John Hewton was the first to be killed, and he was hanged, and then just before death he was cut down, and he was then beheaded and quartered, with his entrails also being cut out and burned. Following this, the remains of the executed were then sent to four parts of London, to show Henry VIII's power. The next month, on the 19th of June 1535, a number of other members of the London Charter House had the same problem. Sebastian Newdigate, Humphrey Middlemore and William Exmew were all taken to Tyburn, where they were also hanged, drawn and quartered. Newdigate was considered on good terms with Henry VIII, and he previously served as a member of the King's Privy Council, but he did sign the oath of succession initially. But he could not accept Henry's changes with becoming the supreme head of the church, and was arrested and held at Marshalsea Prison, and was tortured. He was held in chains for two weeks, secured to a pillar, in an attempt to force him to change his mind, but he did refuse. The king even visited him at the Tower of London, to try to convince him to change his mind, but in front of Henry VIII he refused to do this, and was then sentenced to death. The three were killed on the 19th of June 1535, and were executed in the same manner, being hanged, drawn and quartered. But two years later, in May 1537, Henry VIII went after more members of the Carthusian monks. John Rochester and James Walworth, who were based at the London Charter House, were taken to York, where they were hanged in chains from the battlements of the castle there. The pair had been against the king's changes, and were taken to the city accused of treason. It's believed their executions were done to send a clear message to the people of the north to fall into line, and the executions were in response to the pilgrimage of grace, the protest against the dissolutions of the monasteries. After a while, the bodies of the two monks fell from the battlements, as they were rotting. But in the same year, Henry sought to destroy the order further, and more executions of Carthusians occurred in 1537. In June of that year, William Greenwood, the lay brother of the London Charter House, was starved to death inside of Newgate Prison, in an attempt to get him to accept the king. A deacon and monk named John Davy was also starved to death at Newgate, and also Robert Salt suffered the same fate. Further deaths occurred from starvation, and on the 10th of June, Thomas Green and Walter Pearson died at Newgate. Thomas Scriven and Thomas Reginge both died of starvation at the prison, and the following month so did Richard Beer. Thomas Johnson, a monk who refused to sign the oath, had also been held at Newgate for months, and he was also killed from starvation. More victims of being starved to death at Newgate Prison continued, but there was another member of the London Charter House who was executed on the orders of the King. William Horne was taken to Tyburn, and he was hanged, drawn and quartered, in the same brutal manner that the earlier monks were. He was kept alive longer than the other monks, but was then executed, but with this Henry VIII had sent a clear message to any religious dissenter and opposition in the land. He was forcing people to conform to his religious changes, and to accept him as the head of the church in England, and with this it's believed that people around the country would hear the executions and then support him. Executions were carried out and they had a strong deterrent effect, 
but he completely destroyed the London Charter House and the Carthusian monks. The monks became martyrs, and following their deaths the monastery was dissolved, and the London Charter House was sold and used as a luxury mansion. Before Henry's reign, the Carthusians were seen as incredibly pious, respected and devoted, but they were brutally killed by the Tudor monarch, and the king believed they needed to be brought under control and silenced. The story of the Carthusian monks was a brutal one, and it shows how people could not have an opinion that was different from the king's during the Tudor period. The Carthusian monks were all destroyed by Henry VIII. England has a dark history involving executions and children. In the years following the Tudor period, the laws were changed during a period of time referred to as the Bloody Code, in which hundreds of new offences carried the death sentence. To put people off committing these offences, many executions of even minors were carried out. But Alice Glaston is considered the youngest girl on record to have been legally executed in England. There was a boy who was allegedly hanged for arson, named John Dean, who was condemned at the age of around nine, but Alice Glaston is the youngest girl to be executed. It was said in the records that in the small market town of Much Wenlock, alongside two other criminals, Alice was hanged in front of a crowd that had assembled, but how and why did this young girl face the hangman's noose and the gallows? The parish register and records written by the vicar of Much Wenlock from 1545 states that, here was buried John Dodd of the parish of Little Wenlock who was hanged here, as also Alice Glaston, 11 years of age of the parish of Little Wenlock, and William Harper, a tailor. With this it isn't specifically stated that the three were executed for the same crime, but as much Wenlock was a small settlement, it must be assumed that this could be the case. Three executions occurred at the same time inside of the small town, and it's likely that an executioner was summoned from a bigger settlement nearby to perform the killings. But court records do not exist and have been lost to time, and because of this it's not completely clear what Alice did. She was probably tried at the Wenlock Guildhall, which was a town hall, and also a local courtroom, where judges would preside over cases. These were built five years before the execution, as when Henry VIII dissolved a priory nearby, the court cases needed to be heard somewhere else. On the ground floor of the Guildhall was a prison, and Alice would have been held here inside a small cell for a while. Her story is incredibly sad, but during the Tudor times, there are a number of serious offences that Alice could have been killed for. As she was a female, hanging was a standard death sentence, a method for crimes such as treason for women, as treason in men was dealt with by hanging, drawing and quartering, which was considered a much more savage and sadistic ordeal. But it's unlikely that an 11-year-old girl would have been executed for treason against King Henry VIII. He was very much a paranoid monarch and king, but it's unlikely that he would even order this, especially as the matter was dealt with in the local area and not within London. If it was a threat against the king, Alice would have been taken to London to stand trial, and then would have faced execution probably at Tyburn. Murder was a crime which was dealt with by hanging, and women who had murdered others were hanged for this. Also, theft and arson were two crimes deemed very serious that did carry the death penalty, but petty thieves were dealt with differently, as they were sometimes imprisoned also. Thieves who were found guilty of stealing less than a shilling would be punished in public and were whipped and also branded with hot irons. Many more were locked away inside of the stocks or the pillory, and this punishment was deemed enough. The fact if she was deemed a heretic she would have been liable to be burned at the stake also rules out that Alice Glaston was found guilty of religious crimes or being a heretic. But as Alice was sentenced to death straight away, it shows that what she must have done must have been very serious. It's possible that alongside the two men she was executed with, that she could have been involved in a murder or the death of someone else, or could have been guilty of arson. There are no other records of burials of young children at the time connected to Alice's story, so it's unlikely that she murdered another child. But what is hugely concerning is that Alice Glaston, the young 11-year-old girl, could have been executed after someone may have accused her of being a witch. At this time, many women found themselves accused of witchcraft, and with this they were forced to defend themselves under immense pressure from the men and people who were accusing them, and they were also forced to fight for their lives in front of the judge. Some women were even thrown into lakes and rivers, 
and were weighed down as they were deemed witches. But Alice Glaston could have been sentenced to death, as she may have been accused of being involved in the dark arts. During Henry VIII's reign, this was a common fear, and locals were very scared of women who were accused of witchcraft, and often trials and executions got carried away with, and women were not given a chance to defend themselves. But what is shocking is that a crowd would have gathered to see the execution of the young 11-year-old Alice Glaston, which shows you how brutal Tudor society really was. Tudor England was a terrifying and scary place, which believed it was right to sentence a young child to death. It's a time where Henry VIII executed around 70,000 people during his reign, but of these, Alice Glaston's death has to be considered as one of the most shocking of the Tudor period, and almost as shocking as Anne Boleyn's death. She is a forgotten victim of the time period, but at the time, the age of criminal responsibility was just seven, meaning that someone aged seven could be held accountable for their actions and any crimes that they may have committed. But inside of Much Wenlock, on that dark day, Alice Glaston, the 11-year-old girl, became the child victim of King Henry VIII and King Henry VIII's laws. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.